I actually think that the co-housing model is perfect for what we need in this world, which is more connection. Founded in 1991, the eco-village at Ithaca began as a radical notion to create a more earth-friendly human habitation. Centered on 176 acres at the foot of Cayuga Lake and just two miles from Ithaca, New York, the eco-village houses three neighborhoods, a co-housing community of 230 people, and four on-site organic farms, which are integral in producing food for the region. Though we're just starting out on our own communal living exploration at Flock, we turn to examples like the Eco Village at Ithaca to see what we can learn for our own journey. I am here with Liz Walker at the Eco Village, the Ithaca Eco Village, and yeah, tell me a little bit more about where we're standing because this is such a special place. Yeah, we're standing in front of the common house. You see the earth flag flying. Um, the common house is like a community center for us and we gather here for meals in non-COVID times. Uh, we have a children's playroom. We have eight home offices, so people who are working at home can actually get out of their houses. <laughs> um, we have high-speed internet. Uh, we have laundry, community laundry for 30 households. Uh, we have, I'll show you over here, we have solar panels on yeah. the roof. So this is just one of many villages at the Eco Village. Uh, we call them neighborhoods. Neighborhoods, yeah, okay. Yeah, so <laughs> we have three neighborhoods. We have a total of 100 households. You'll be seeing a lot of solar panels, but <laughs> it's kind of cool to have them on the common house. We put them up about, I don't know, maybe 15 years ago, 20 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. So we have three uh, neighborhoods mm -hmm. that are each have their own character. They were built at different times. We tried to use the, the latest, greenest building technologies. So this is our very first neighborhood. We designed and built it in 1996 and 1997. Hmm. And we have 30 households here. Uh, this is the second neighborhood. And we have these cutesy nicknames for our neighborhood. So yeah. this one is Frog, First Resident Group. And you might have heard the frogs in the background. Yeah. Um, this is Second Neighborhood Group. This was designed and built in 2002 to 2005, also 30 households. And then as we walk around, you'll see Tree, which is the third residential eco-village experience. <laughs> <laughs> I see, so you're giving an acronym to Frog, Song, and then Tree. That's right. Right, okay. And we joke about tree frogs yeah, singing, sing a song. you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One of the funny things is, hey there, Cheryl. Yeah, so we have people of all ages living here. We mm -hmm. have newborn babies. We had two babies born during the pandemic. Wow. And then we have people in their 80s who live mm -hmm. here, and many of them are still very active. And we try to create a really cross-generational, very inclusive environment here. Mm -hmm. So it's all about earth-friendly living. Mm -hmm. That's really what we're aiming for here. And then how did it all start? Like, where did it all begin? Oh, it's a long story. Yeah. Maybe come up here and yeah. just show you these maps. Yeah, absolutely. And then we can go for a walk. So we have 175 acres here. I just love the view up here for the one thing. The view is beautiful. <laughs> and I, when we were walking, there's ducks that don't even scatter. Yeah. They're just yeah. part of the whole mix, you know? It's true. <laughs> we, all, we all love seeing the ducklings grow up. Yeah. So back to your question about how this all started. We, uh, when I say we, mm -hmm. uh, my friend Joan Bocaire and I were the co-founders. And one of our projects before we started this was we created a walk, uh, we organized a walk for the environment back in 1990. And we gathered together 150 people of all ages uh, from different countries. And we walked from 
Los Angeles to New York City over the course what? of nine months. Oh my gosh. Yeah, so it was it was actually great training summer yeah. because wow. we overcame I mean, what, for so a many obstacles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, no. were, we were walking 15 to 20 miles a day. Did you find Tr like uh, connecting trails, or did you have to walk on highways in no, some cases? No, we, we, we walked on highways, we walked okay. on secondary roads. Um, we were stopping in, you know, we stopped in 200 towns and cities across mm. the country. Amazing. And we did educational workshops in the schools, we planted trees, we started recycling programs, because mm -hmm. that, that was really early on. Yeah. We talked about global warming back in 1990, and our our real motivation was just wake up, people! Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's time to do something for Mother Earth. Mm -hmm. So we learned so much from that experience. And during the course of the walk, Joan started saying, "Well, hey, you know, we're having this real impact because everywhere we went, we got tons of media attention." Mm -hmm. We were working with local groups. We were uplifting mm -hmm. the work that was already happening in these right. communities. And how about if we created a community that just stayed in one place? Yeah. What a radical concept. <laughs> and, and then we wouldn't have to walk 15 to 20 miles yeah. a day, and yeah. we could still accomplish some of the same goals. Right. So that was really the beginning of the germ of an idea for this eco-village. There were other models out there like this, correct? Or had you Not, known of them before? Or? So the term eco-village was coined in 1989. Okay. The co-housing model that we're using, which is based on community-oriented living, mm -hmm. it started in Denmark uh, in the 60s, but it, it only became popularized in the United States in the 90s. Mm. So there was, at the time, we had heard of the term eco-village, and there were a few around the world, but very few. We had heard the term co-housing, but never seen one. Right, and it's different than like a homeowners association or a community land trust, right? Yes, Okay. yes. Because those existed. Right, yeah. right. So, so part of the idea behind this place was to utilize models that already exist in different places around the U.S. and also, you know, around the world, and just say, hey, we don't have to reinvent the wheel, but let's take the best of what's working from, you know, CSA farming was brand new back then, so we adopted that. Uh, Co-housing was brand new, so we adopted that. The, the idea of an eco-village, a village where people come together and really consciously try to live by their values of being more earth-friendly, we adopted that. Mm -hmm. um, all kinds of experiential learning opportunities, that's really part of the eco-village model, that is also part of our model here. So we are now part of a global movement of eco-villages, which is thousands strong, and that's really exciting. Mm. I love being connected with all these people around the world. Mm. And then we're part of this national co-housing movement, and we have, I think it's about 175 co-housing communities now in the United States. But we're, we're probably one of the most well-known eco-villages in the country, and even we're one of a handful of, you know, maybe 10 eco-villages in the world that are really quite well known. Yeah, and, and why do you think that uh, is? Is it the, how you've grown over the years? Is it your, you know, your uh, ability to get out into media? Is it the programs that you run? What do you think it is, combination thereof? I think it's a combination, but we started out with a really big vision. We were just incredibly naive. <laughs> Um, Joan was a kindergarten teacher, I was an anti-nuclear organizer, and we just uh, gathered a lot of people together and we fundraised. We had no money. I was a single mom with two young kids. And we got, we raised the money, $400,000, to purchase this beautiful piece of land, 175 acres. 
And uh, I think the vision attracted people who were motivated, smart, really um, community conscious people. Did you come from this area or did you, you do some research and say, okay, we wanna be here? Because I think it's important yeah. when you're starting an eco-village or any kind of co-housing yeah. for that matter, that you're within some sort of vicinity that people could have access to jobs and other things, if you're not producing your yes. own materials or jobs yeah. on site, I yeah. guess. Yeah. Actually, that speaks to this piece of land because we had, at the very beginning, back in 1991, we looked at different parcels of land in the Ithaca area. And we chose Ithaca because this was where Joan lived and she had a connection with Cornell University. So we automatically had some respect from the very beginning because of that affiliation with Cornell. Uh, we were part of, and still are, part of the Center for Transformative Action, which is a nonprofit affiliated with Cornell. Mm -hmm. So when we looked at land in this area, we chose six different parcels and really studied them. And one of the parcels was free. It was in Brooktondale. Oh yeah, and which has become really hot now. <laughs> <laughs> has it really? <laughs> it's become like, yeah. yeah, the trendy place to go, but it's in yeah. a little bit more of a valley and you have a, a bit more of a, a, a trip you know, ahead of you. Exactly, yeah. so we consciously chose not to accept free land in Brooktondale because we knew if we were building an eco-village of, at the time we thought about 500 people, it's ended mm -hmm. up being half of that, <laughs> um, everybody would have to commute to work. In those days, people didn't work at home. <laughs> um, people would have to go to school, they would have to go shopping, you know, entertainment, everything involved the car. and. The ideal would have been to be in downtown Ithaca, but we wanted farming and food production to be a big part of what we do. So we chose the next best thing, which is two miles from downtown Ithaca. Mm. And it, it's turned out to be, look at this. I mean, this is absolutely <laughs> gorgeous, I think. We built that pond, that was the very first thing that we built. And it actually was very easy because we just excavated <laughs> and we didn't even have to put in a liner of clay or anything. It's just uh, 16 feet deep. It's wonderful for swimming. We have fish in the pond. We have ducks. We use it for kayaking. We skate on it in the winter. It's pretty cool. And then this is, uh, so you said 175 acres, and you just got that right from the beginning, the get-go, 175, or did you add on along the time? Uh, we bought the whole piece of land. It, it actually, we raised the money in two weeks, mm -hmm. and I can't believe this. I mean, it was really before the days of the internet. It yeah. was before cell phones. Yeah. I remember my ear got so sore from <laughs> talking on the phone, holding that to my ear. Yeah. I mean, what was the what was the deal where you're saying like, hey, is, was it a return on investment or was it like this is a donation to get us up and running? So we, we, we actually asked people for loans mm -hmm. and at that time we were offering, you know, interest. Um, it was compounding interest, which was a mistake, mm -hmm. but it was three and a half percent interest. Mm -hmm. And we talked to people and said, this is our passionate vision will you join us? Mm -hmm. And so the people that invested, they were amazingly supportive. They really loved the idea mm -hmm. of an eco-village that was brand new in this country at the time. Yeah, that's not something that you always see in a place. So, you know, the, the zoning laws, everything. I would imagine that some towns you have that up against you because you're, you're building many homes on a 
jointly owned piece of land, but there's different families on it, right? right so it right. could cause a little bit of <laughs> disruption, I would imagine, from banks and anything else, you know, you're looking at. Insurance, everybody. Yeah. I mean, even the state attorney general's office was involved. So, yeah, we had a lot of legal hurdles at the beginning because <clears throat> we were essentially you know, creating disruption in the mainstream. Exactly. And trying to figure things out. You're a rabble rouser. New. And then they asked you, <laughs> what did you do before? And you're like, I'm an anti-nuke act activist. <laughs> and they're like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> so here is what we did. We partnered with a local architect who is also a builder and low-income housing developer. and. He and his wife were great, Jerry and Claudia Weisberg. They had lived in Ithaca for 20 years. They were part of a local co-op, housing co-op. And so they really knew the ropes locally. Right. And they were able to help us navigate. And one of the first uh, things we did after purchasing the land was we hired Jerry Weisberg for $6,000 and we said, Here's our vision of creating this eco-village. What would you recommend? How yeah. do we do infrastructure? How do we work with the town? How do we navigate? Yeah. This is a totally foreign language for now, us. Now, even before that, which, by the way, it's a great tip because you're partnering with somebody who knows the ropes yeah. of like building, yeah. building and zoning and co codes and all that other kind of stuff. Yeah. However, how did you, did you legally incorporate? And, and if yes. so, how did you do it before you actually went out and got the, uh, the funds, because I'd imagine you'd have to present yourself as professional when, right. before you go out. Right, so we, we put together a team of people who were all volunteer, um, somebody who was a banker, somebody who was a de real estate developer, um, I forget who else, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a number of local people who were really smart about money and about the local real estate. And we had to um, we had to have the investors prove that they were sophisticated investors, mm -hmm. meaning that if they put in $130,000, which one couple from St. Louis did, um, that they could lose that and not be totally bankrupt mm -hmm. or bereft or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so we had to prove that to New York State, uh, that these people knew what they were doing and uh, that it was all reasonable. And we incorporated as a 501c3 nonprofit. Got it. And so that was the entity that we used to create the land, uh, to um, buy the land. And so we actually incorporated as a nonprofit in the first six months. Got it. And I remember writing the bylaws, oh my God, so many details <laughs> and, uh, you know, getting consensus on this clause and that clause and really trying to think ahead mm -hmm. about what do we what do we want to be when we grow up as an eco village <laughs> so we still have that nonprofit and uh, it's served us well so let me show you this land so the land is as i mentioned it's just 2 miles from downtown Ithaca so this is route 79 also called Mecklenburg road and this way <laughs> is to downtown Ithaca, mm -hmm. two miles. And so you came in on the entry road, Rachel Carson Way. Mm -hmm. And when we purchased this land, it was owned by Lakeside Development Corporation. They went bankrupt. They had planned to, to subdivide this 175 acre parcel of land, which is was abandoned farmland mm -hmm. at the time. And they were gonna chop it up into one acre lots, lots of driveways, lots of roads, right. lots of infrastructure. Which and is what town, traditionally what people do. Yeah. 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 And so this is totally typical American development. Um, they were gonna leave 10% of the land as open space. So here's an open area. And actually you wouldn't be able to build on it because it's a wetland mm -hmm. and there's another open space here and you couldn't really build on that because that is so Slopey, steep yeah. 
and here's another open space and there's this intermittent stream going mm -hmm. through it and it's very steep. So this is typical American development, 90% development, 10% open space, which is required by the town of Ithaca. Now, first- The 10% open space is required by the town of Ithaca is what you're saying. Yeah. 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 And so here's where the first, well, one of many, many miracles in the development of this place happened. Um, we, we actually saw this piece of land. Some of our neighbors told us that it was available when these people um, went belly up. Mm -hmm. And when they went bankrupt, it reverted to the bank. The bank sold it at auction, and we made a bid at half price. Wow. So it was $400,000. Wow. You know, they were offering it for $800,000. Yeah. One of the people on our board of directors is really great at getting bargains. Yeah. And she said, we can get it for four hundred thousand. So because there was it. no infrastructure on it, there was nothing. Nothing. It was yeah. abandoned farm fields. Yeah. So it wasn't really quote unquote like worth much. But yeah. you'd have to pay cash, wouldn't you? Have to because yeah. there is no infrastructure. So right. you gotta yeah. So that's pay what, it up. So that's why we had to raise that four hundred thousand right. dollars. And then it took us two weeks for Joan and I to raise the money just by calling up people mm -hmm. all over the country that anybody we knew that had money because yeah. we sure didn't have any. <laughs> and all these people came through and then it took a year to put the legal infrastructure together. Wow, yeah. okay. <laughs> so here is this way of doing development. Mm -hmm. Once we purchased the land, um, which happened a year after our very first meeting, we, we we had a five-day meeting to kick things off in June 1991. Uh, we called it our envisioning uh, gathering, and we drew about 100 people from all over the country. I was living in San Francisco at the time. Hmm. And um, so a year afterwards, we were able to close on the land on the summer solstice hmm. of June 1992. And then we started planning for what we wanted to create. This looks like a lot of our maps. <laughs> We're like, or you get the overhead map or the graphic map, and then you start like drawing on top of it. Right. <laughs> so this is actually what we have created. So here is the Route 79, the main road to Ithaca. Here is Rachel Carson Way. Uh, here are the three neighborhoods, and what we chose very early on is we said we can do so much better than that mm -hmm. first development plan. We want to model something exactly the opposite. Mm -hmm. So how about if we build on 10% of the land and leave 90% as open space? So here we are. Each of these neighborhoods is five acres, and that includes green space around them and we densely clustered the housing. That is not typical in many eco-villages. People mm -hmm. tend to spread out just, it's the American way, yeah. elbow room. <laughs> but this is the co-housing model, and yeah. the whole concept is creating community. And one way you create community is like traditional villages anywhere in the world. So I actually give tours to people from all over, and I have had literally had people from China, from uh, South America, from different countries in Europe, mm -hmm. from Africa, mm -hmm. from Nepal. Mm -hmm. And they go through, they walk through our village and then they say, this reminds me so much of home. Mm. And I just get this wonderful feeling because what we've managed to recreate here is like you know, this is quintessential human community.
part of it is that people are living close to each other. You know, go figure. <laughs> this, is, this is the traditional way of living. You don't have cars disrupting every move you make. Mm -hmm. Kids can play in the street. Mm -hmm. People can eat together. Mm -hmm. um, every time I go out my front door, I see a neighbor, a friend, and it's just, it's a great way to live. So the streets are all pedestrian, and we'll walk through them, but I just yeah. wanted to make this point with the map. But just to point out, uh, we have these three neighborhoods, 100 households, all densely clustered on 10% of the land. We have um, four organic farms. This map was actually created before we had our fourth farm, which is three-story farm which is quite large here. And are they leasing the land, or how does it work? Yeah, Okay. Yeah. We really value our farmers. They do such hard work, and it is so hard to be a farmer, and you probably know about this, or are learning about it through your homesteading. Mm -hmm. And so we, we want it to be as easy as possible for them. So what we do is, we lease the land to them and we lease it for the cost of the taxes on that acreage, which is almost nothing because mm -hmm. it's agricultural yeah. zoned. So yeah, that really helps them a lot. And then how does it um, work and how does it benefit the community? Like do you, is it a benefit that you could go to the berry patch or have your CSA here or how does it, yeah, how does it work yeah. that way? So, I, I love Tuesdays because that's the CSA pickup day and about half of us who live in the village are part of West Haven Farm and we just take our little cloth bags and walk over here <laughs> around Groundswell and over to West Haven Farm and pick up our food for the week yeah. and the CSA is pretty big. I mean, they feed a thousand people a week during the growing season. Actually, I should say West Haven Farm feeds a thousand people a week. They do half of that through the farmer's market, half through the CSA. Yeah, so which most is really of the impressive. Families are Be outside. Yeah, because it's like your your own village, yeah. but you have these almost you know community programs that reach outward into yeah. Ithaca and the surrounding Finger Lakes. And that was a key part of our vision from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. We we didn't want to be isolated. We didn't want to even be self sufficient. Mm -hmm. We have always seen ourselves as part of a broader ecosystem, both uh, environmentally and socially and economically. So we, we really are part of the region and we strive to be more and more integrated as yeah. we go along. I wanted to just show the contrast between these two. So this is typical suburban development. This is the exact opposite. Mm -hmm. This is 10% development. This is 90% development. This is 90% open space used for agriculture, wildlife, wetlands, meadows, forest. And this is a little tiny 10%. So that is what, I, I think that's one of our bigger environmental statements. And when planners come to visit here, um, or architects or developers, this is what I really like to point out. We have this really interesting interface with the natural world, mm -hmm. and uh, nature is all around us, and we love it, and then we have these little battles with the geese, or, <laughs> you know, we have muskrats in the pond sometimes that are burrowing into the pond, yeah. and, um, making it leak, so we have to figure out how we how we interface <laughs> with nature. And you must have to agree upon that, right? Yeah. yeah like, because like you, might, you must have to go back to your board and <laughs> talk about that. I, I, I wondered yeah. about that because you have to have some type of internal zoning or policies, like can everyone have a dog? You know, are, are people right. resistant to having dogs yapping? Like when you start to live so close yeah. together, I wonder how that changes things. Well, those are really excellent questions. So um, yeah, we, we make a lot of decisions about a lot of things and we actually use consensus in two of the neighborhoods and then we use what's called dynamic governance in the third neighborhood, which is uh, a little bit more um, 
Hey, Soren. Dynamic governance is perhaps more sophisticated than consensus. It is more of a business-like model, but also very participatory. So our governance model is each neighborhood has its own board of directors, but the boards mostly are doing the will of what the 30 to 40 households want mm -hmm. in that neighborhood. Then we have tons of committees and working groups. And then um, we have spontaneous groups that come together for all kinds of purposes. And so we strive for agreement on all these levels. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's really tough. Yeah. And then, I mean, when people think about consensus, though, oftentimes people think of like, well, everybody has equal say. But yeah. that might not always be true too because some sure. people might not always be as engaged so they could potentially yeah. stand back and say okay I know that yeah. my opinion might not be as weighted as yours because you are far more engaged in this yeah. so consensus has a lot of nuance to it as well that's true that's yeah. true and and the same with dynamic governance and so we also have a village-wide um, meetings once a month and yeah, we, we have very different levels of participation, and it depends on where somebody is in their journey in life. Mm -hmm. Like, if somebody is uh, a single parent with young kids and working full-time, they're not going to be able to participate in the same way that many of us retired people are. Mm -hmm. So we actually really value our retired people because, uh, frankly, if you don't have a full-time job, you have so much more time on your hands mm -hmm. and really want to make a contribution. So often it's the elders that are leading things. Mm -hmm. This is your 30th anniversary. Yeah. So how did Eco Village not, and excuse my language, but age sure. out? You know what I mean? Because yeah. you're attracting people who are your peers. Yeah. How did you keep it relevant? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. So when we started this place in 1996, we were mostly young families and mm -hmm. singles and, um, and some older people. Uh, we had about 60 children in Frog when we started. In the whole village wow. now, we have 42 kids. Wow. Uh, you know, this is up to the age of 18. Yeah. So we, uh, some of the 20 somethings have come back to live here, which is kind of cool. Um, in the same houses or how does, how does that work? Well, during COVID, yeah. frankly, a number of young people didn't have jobs. Yeah. You know, they lost them due to COVID. And so they came back to live with their parents mm. uh, many times temporarily, but mm -hmm. sometimes they moved in on a more permanent basis. Mm -hmm. Some of them have their own places here. Uh, so there is some of that, but in addition to that, we really want um, an intergenerational community mm -hmm. here. So we attract young families in different ways. There's a, a special family Facebook that gets a lot of traffic about living at Eco Village. We have parents who, you know, they just share some of what it's like to raise kids here. And mm -hmm. this is an amazing place for kids. Mm -hmm. My granddaughter is visiting for the first time. She's seven. She's lived in India most of her life. During COVID, she was locked up in this apartment, you know, fifth floor apartment in Delhi for like nine months. Couldn't even go outside much. And here she gets to play and, you know, meet other kids her right. age. And she's just having a total blast. She's learning how to swim for the first <laughs> time. So I think we met her actually the other day. Did you? Yeah. <laughs> she's very social. She yeah. goes up to everybody. Hi, my name is Devika. <laughs> is that who it yeah, was? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, she's really cute. So it, you had mentioned that um, you know, the, the, the farmland is leased. When yeah. people get a home, is it like a 49 or 99 year lease? Or how does it actually work? Do they get oh. to buy their own home? They buy their own home, but they're actually buying shares in the co-op. I see. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. this this uh, neighborhood, Frog, is a New York State housing cooperative. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have shares for the houses based on what size they are. Mm -hmm. And you can tell the houses look pretty similar. They're all duplexes, so yeah. they share an exterior wall. So this is two houses here. 
but they are, um, they're different widths. Yeah. But that's one of the ways that, even though they have the same interior design pretty yeah. much, some houses are one bedroom, some houses are four bedrooms. Mm -hmm. And they're, they vary in price and uh, shares accordingly. Got it. And then are each of the communities built that way or are there different uh, models for different communities? There are different models for different communities. So I thought we could walk through this neighborhood a little bit sure. and you could get a feel for it. And then we can go over to the other neighborhoods. The gardens are glorious here. Oh, <laughs> I'm glad you like them. Does each individual home keep up with their own garden and have their yeah. own landscaping ideas? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and is there any restrictions of that or not really? Uh, we, we Cutting down a tree, all that other kind of stuff. So cutting down trees is kind of a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody once cut down a tree without asking permission yeah. and uh, there was quite an uproar. <laughs> I, I, when that happens, I call it a kerfluffle. <laughs> and I think of it like chickens. You know how if you walk into yeah. a pen of chickens and yeah. they all go buck, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Buck. <laughs> So that's what I think of as a, you know, a kerfluffle where people get their feathers <laughs> all fluffed up. <laughs> And then it dies down after a while. Yeah. So, <laughs> so each neighborhood is based on a co-op model. Mm -hmm. And so everybody is doing the share thing. Right. And that means that the co-op has a certain amount of um, power over, uh, you know, decisions like who moves in, mm -hmm. who uh, gets kicked out or whatever. Mm -hmm. In fact, we we basically never kick anybody out yeah. and we really like as much diversity as we can get. Yeah. But if there were somebody who turned out to be an ax murderer, we would have legal power to say no to that person. Yeah. Well, you it's so funny that you say that because <laughs> when we were kind of developing and there's only a few of us who are on our own land. Yeah. When we were developing our bylaws and our rules and how would we come together and how do we even make decisions? Yeah. Uh, we were like, well, what happens if your child <laughs> becomes a murderer? You you are literally creating these completely different scenario like really off kilter scenarios exactly. just to try to get an answer to yeah the issue that you're, even if it's it might true. be a small chance, yeah. very, very insy bitsy chance, you're That's, really trying to look through every single problem that you could address I, in advance. Uh, yes, <laughs> you're, you're describing it very well, Summer, because <laughs> that's how a lawyer has to think. Yeah. And so what we found in, in developing this whole project is we had to start thinking like planners, mm -hmm. like developers, mm -hmm. like architects, like lawyers, like insurance people, mm -hmm. um, we actually, I'll tell you a funny story, we actually had our insurance canceled because somebody uh, somebody filmed, um, we have an annual uh, uh, polar day, um, a polar bear uh, where you um, run jump. Out, where you run out to the, to the, to the, to the, icy the lake naked. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, some people do it naked, some people with bathing suits, but you break through the ice yeah. on New Year's Day yeah. and go swimming. So that's an annual tradition here. Yeah. And somebody put a photo of it on our website and the insurance got canceled. <laughs> so it's funny, but it actually, you know, it had real repercussions. Yeah. So we just, we have to live in the real world, the mainstream world, but also show as many alternatives as we can. Well, you did not read that fine print in that insurance. That's funny. <laughs> so do you want to see the inside of a house? We'd we could, love to. Yeah, that would be amazing. You can come into my home. So this is like the early home then. Yeah, yeah. 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 So this is the it's first got a great feel generation to it. Yeah. of homes. This is... I mean, uh, lots of great light. It's got a loft, like, you know, yeah. yeah, loft feel. So we have 14 foot high window walls on the south side and these are passive solar homes and 
these are triple glazed windows, oh, which was wow. really unusual in 1996. That is deluxe. <laughs> <laughs> we, we actually, what? Fiberglass. Oh, fiberglass. Fiberglass. Wow. That's rare. And so these are actually from a factory in Winnipeg, mm -hmm. and we got a deal on them because that was one of our affordability strategies mm -hmm. was to design and build everything fairly similar to each other. Yeah. And so we ordered pallets, many pallets of windows from them. That's and they so kept smart. their factory open during the winter just for us. Wow. And they came to our opening ceremony. Wow. <laughs> so you have to be really, you know, what you're really intimating is that you have to be really organized, thoughtful, and really think a lot of these things through. It kind of reminds me of like our trip to Green Star and how they had the buying mm. club and you have to organize people in order to yeah. buy bulk in advance in order to get that lower cost price. You're doing the same for windows and building materials. Yeah. You need yeah. to be on it in order to yeah. be able to do yeah. this. So you said you come in naive, but you really learned a lot along the way. <laughs> yes, yes. And and we had great mentors. Uh, yeah. 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 Do you ha are those walking irises? They are. Ah, oh, look at I, that. I unfortunately haven't taken great care of it recently, <laughs> but yeah, it, this is a plant that my son Jason brought home from school like when he was five, and now he's visiting with his daughter from yeah. India, and he's now 38. Oh my God. So this is the mother plant, and then I have given away so many irises. That's I just so love great. Them. They're very cool. I just started um, to grow, grow those maybe a year and a half ago, just as an alternative to the uh, the Chlorophytum camosum, which is a spider plant. Oh, yes. Which you're familiar yeah, with, yeah. which is more common, but you know, those are so cool. They propagate in a very similar manner. Yeah, and yeah. what I love is they smell like um, gardenias, mm. and they look like orchids, yeah. and they only come out for one day. Yeah. And I, I just, you know, I track the days. Like some days I'll have 13 blossoms, <laughs> and I'll just watch those little blossoms start out like this, and then they gradually, gradually <laughs> open up, and then they release their fragrance, and. I just, I love it. And I used to stay home from work on yeah. days when I had that many <laughs> blossoms. It was just like such a special day. I, I thought, okay, you're this like, is gonna be a really cool day. Something great is happening you here. You call in, you call in and you're like, <laughs> I have to stay home from work today. <laughs> I'm really sick. <laughs> really, you just wanted to smell the flowers. <laughs> but in my case, I'm working for the Eco Village so Indeed. people understand. <laughs> So really when you were planning this whole location with the architect or the landscape designer, you were planning for 500 people, right? So Initially. Initially. Yeah, so first. were you gonna do more densely clustered communities of like, say like 50 to 100, or are you, were you always just gonna do communities of 30? We were thinking communities of 30, mm -hmm. and the, the reason for that is that in co-housing, they've done a lot of thinking about what makes for an optimal group of human beings who can really relate well to each other. Yeah. And so 30 to 35, you know, 40 at the top yeah. is kind of like the, seems to be a good number. Okay. If you, if you have a really small group, like some co-housing communities are as small as 10 households, yeah. Um, people can perhaps not get along with each other. Right. You know, if you have disruption in that size group, it's going to hurt more. Mm. Um, in a group of 30 households, it's small enough that everybody really knows each other. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there's more, there's just a little more slack around mm. social relationships. Mm. Um, People know each other, but they, uh, there's also room for people to, you know, 
not everybody loves each other, but they may um, feel like extended family. So it might be like an extended family where you have a cousin that you don't particularly care for, but then you have three cousins that you love. And so you just learn how to get along. And I actually think that the co-housing model is perfect for what we need in this world, which is more connection and connection, including with people who are very different from ourselves and who may have somewhat different values. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as human beings living on this planet, we're in crisis, we're in terrible crisis, environmentally, politically, socially, economically. And we have to figure out different ways of living. And so this is one attempt, one experiment in trying something that allows for people to work through their differences as best we can and really craft a way of living that is very intentional. And you mentioned that you try to do things by consensus or dynamic governance before. Mm -hmm. But what are some of the other softer skills? Like, have you had to have a mediator on site or like to come up with like when people do really have significant differences? Like, what are some of those soft skills that you've had to, to learn and execute? Yeah. Oh, communication is huge. <laughs> we have some people who live here who have been teaching nonviolent communication for decades. So that's really helpful. We all have to learn how to communicate well. And what we found is people need to be able to understand themselves and be able to speak out from that place of accepting themselves and knowing what their needs are. And listening is huge. You know, so many people, I think, in this culture live in a very fast world where everything has to get done and it's all about me, me, me. And this is about we. And so in order to get to that place, you just like need to slow down, mm -hmm. listen, feedback. Did I hear you correctly? Mm -hmm. What would you like to do? This is what I need. What do you need? And so it's in some ways very simple skills. Mm -hmm. um, and in other ways, it's it's kind of complex. Hey. <laughs> and the other thing you mentioned is that you started off as a nonprofit. Have yeah. you stayed as a nonprofit or have you had to come up with like different forms of structure as you've evolved and grown? Um, we have so many different structures here. <laughs> really, uh, uh, we, we have an on-site lawyer who's yeah. great. Um, who he, lives here? Who lives okay. here, yeah. Bill Goodman, and he's a really good man. <laughs> and um, we have a, we've had a chat with him too. So. Have you? Yeah. <laughs> oh, great. Yeah, so he is uh, very skilled at kind of thinking through legal issues mm -hmm. and um, looks like we're having a bike consultation yeah. here. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, and what he and other lawyers advised us very mm -hmm. early on is to have different legal entities for different purposes. Mm -hmm. And so we're not traditional developers. Mm -hmm. Those of us who created the first neighborhood, we, we couldn't put all of our life savings on the line to create the second neighborhood. What if it went belly up? We, mm -hmm. we couldn't afford that. Mm -hmm. So by each, uh, neighborhood having its own co-op structure, people had to put in their own money, do their own decision making, and they were somewhat insulated from disaster uh, from each other. Then we have the village, uh, which is a not-for-profit as well, the village uh, association, I think it's Aviva, and so that owns the land surrounding the neighborhoods, not a lot of land, but about 20 acres. And so our joint infrastructure, like our road, mm -hmm. our ponds, our parking areas are owned by the VA. Mm -hmm. And we all have decision-making 
over that. So each entity has its own legal structure, its own board of directors, its own budget. So we approve annual budgets for each one. And then um, in most cases, the neighborhoods have separate committees and those have their own budgets and they have their own leadership structure depending on which neighborhood. And we have some village-wide teams, like I'm on the village cook team. We're the ones who cook dinners for 30 to 50 people uh, once or twice a week. And so we each have systems mm -hmm. in place for how we're gonna do everything. You know, it can get kind of complicated, but particularly for newcomers, but it all makes sense. So it's, it's pretty organic. Mm -hmm. And I also think of it in permaculture terms that there is, there's a lot of overlap in functions um, and that there's some redundancy, which is also helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then is everybody who serves on those committees and um, who's advising you, is it from in, coming from internally from the Eco Village or is there some people who can actually serve on those boards and everything outside the Eco Village? That's a good question. Mm -hmm. Hi. Hello. Thank you. It looks like you just got some help with your bike. <laughs> And then, you know, you had mentioned some of the um, budgeting and the communal spaces, the communal road. Yeah. Do people have to pay into uh, like a monthly rate or in yes. order to be able to maintain yeah. some of that? Yeah. How does that Absolutely. work? Absolutely. Okay. In um, each neighborhood, we pay a co-op fee mm -hmm. on a monthly basis. And when I tell you what it is, you'll think it's kind of high, yeah. but it includes all the taxes for the unit and for the land surrounding the neighborhood and for the common house. And then it is um, the taxes, it's the electricity, um, which we pay for, at least in Frog, mm -hmm. from our communal solar panels. Mm -hmm. um, what else does it include? Snow oh, it's all, or? it's snow removal. Yeah. It's all the Mowing. village associations. Yeah. yeah. It, we hardly pay for anything. We do most of our own work, mm -hmm. volunteer, but we do pay for snow removal. Mm -hmm. We contract for that. And let's say, you know, there's an issue with somebody's boiler mm -hmm. um, or a boiler in the common house, mm -hmm. that has to be repaired. So mm -hmm. we, we do hire electricians and carpenters and things like mm -hmm. that when we need them, plumbers. So in our household, uh, Jared and I pay about $900 a month. Mm -hmm. And that includes <clears throat> all of that, the taxes, the infrastructure upkeep, and a bunch of money that goes into a capital fund for future repairs. Mm -hmm. And that's actually a very clever way that co-ops um, are legally required by the state to plan ahead into the future for 30 years. Mm -hmm. So we start putting in, you know, even at the very beginning of the neighborhood, we were saving for our roof repairs 30 years from now. Got it, yeah. So it's unusual for us to have an experience where we have out-of-pocket costs that mm -hmm. exceed that. Mm -hmm. And compared, I've been told, I don't have experience with home ownership outside of here, mm -hmm. But um, I've been told that compared to what a typical homeowner would pay in taxes and insurance and maintenance costs, and let alone setting aside a future savings account for repairs, that it's actually pretty inexpensive. Mm. So is, is somebody, when they come in and they, if a house goes vacant, yeah. how do you post in order to show that there's a home available? We post it on our website. There's mm -hmm. a place that is rentals and sales. Mm -hmm. So our website is divided into three parts, live, learn, and grow. Mm -hmm. Hey there. <laughs> good morning, good morning. <laughs> I just want to say hi to my granddaughter. And then you said you also have rentals. Is that new? Yeah. Or is that um, something that you we, implemented in the beginning? So at the beginning, we didn't have any extra money to mm -hmm. create extra housing. Um, but over time, 
a number of us have rented out rooms in our homes as a means of getting extra income. So when my two kids were in college, for instance, mm -hmm. Jared and I rented out their rooms. Mm -hmm. and Even to one of my friends, Dan. <laughs> oh, right, yeah. right, that's right, I had forgotten that. Yeah, he lived here for a while. <laughs> yeah, like a year and a half, I yeah. think. Yeah, it was great to have him. So we create little communities within the community. Mm -hmm. And one of the houses here, this house here, mm -hmm. um, the woman who built it, uh, she rented out like most of the rooms in her house. So mm -hmm. it, it has been a changing communal house, mm -hmm. um, different people, different years. But um, in the third neighborhood, we built that at the time we were organizing it and getting people from all over the country to commit. Mm -hmm. And then the Great Recession happened in 2008. Mm -hmm. And a lot of uh, particularly young families had to bow out because yeah. suddenly they're, you know, maybe they owned a house in California or, you know, Florida or someplace else. And a lot of those places, they, you know, all their equity disappeared overnight. Yeah. So they were not able to come anymore. So at that point, those of us who were older, mm -hmm. um, in some cases, people were able to purchase um, an additional home and then make that available for rent. So in the third neighborhood tree, we have, I would have to count it up, but I think it's like 10 rentals now out of 40. So that seems like a really good thing. It brings in more a more diverse population. Frankly, yeah. we don't have nearly as many people of color as we would like. And as you probably know, in this country, uh, so many people of color, particularly African-Americans, have been really disenfranchised over the generations. And so they have much less working capital. Mm -hmm. So rentals make um, a more, you know, it make it more accessible for mm -hmm. younger people, for single people, for single parents, for people of color. So we, it adds a lot of vibrancy. And then I think you, you said that you're, you attempted to do this with the farms as well. You know, West Haven Farm, didn't they get a new owner as well? Yes, yeah. yeah. And then was that somewhat financed to a certain degree or? So, um, Jen and John Bocair Smith, uh, this is Joan's daughter and son-in-law, oh, okay. started West Haven Farm back at, at, right when we bought the land, 1992, mm -hmm. and developed it into this amazing farm, the first CSA in this area of New York. And so it was huge for mm -hmm. them to retire from farming. They're still working, but doing other jobs. And they, they looked at literally for years mm -hmm. for the right people. And then when they decided to sell their farm, there was a wonderful Mexican family, Carlos and Lorena, who had grown up in a small town in Mexico and had been working on various organic farms in this area. And Carlos and Lorena could afford to buy the farm, but they couldn't afford to also buy a house right. here. And so Jen and Ellen over here, who's like grandma for the kids, um, took on fundraising for them. And a number of us put in really significant funds, either no interest or low interest, to help Carlos and Lorena buy their house. And there were also lots of smaller donations. And that allowed them to purchase a home at Eco Village so they could be right there as farmers, which is important. Yeah. And also, they're such a wonderful family. Yeah. It's really lovely yeah. to have them here. And they're such great farmers, too. They're producing all this wonderful food. I think that's uh, important because in some cases you could have, it's almost like homeowner, fi it's financing, but you, that's what you could get with co-housing or community is that you guys could pull your own resources to say, okay, well, somebody's, yeah, somebody's, you know, 
not doing as well this time around, or this person wants to invest in something, can we give like a micro loan or some type of loan, low interest, like you said, no interest loans, to people yeah. in order to be able to make that happen? That's, you wouldn't usually get that in like a suburban, right. all American community like right. you were ma uh, making mention of before because you don't have that community center, you don't have that communication with one another. Yeah, yeah. yeah. When you have trust between people, all kinds of things are possible. Mm. And I love that about our community. And, you know, there are times when we really have a lot of tension here and there's fallout about different things, but underlying it all is an amazing sense of real community uh, cohesion that allows for these kinds of experiments mm -hmm. and allows people to step out of their comfort zone mm -hmm. a little bit and say, you know, my well-being is actually predicated on other people around me having well-being. Right. And our well-being as a community is actually predicated on some of our low-income neighbors in Ithaca being well-fed. Mm -hmm. And so during the pandemic, um, we've had a number of people here who have been really proactive about um, getting food, extra food from our farms and from our gardens and donating the produce and, uh, and sometimes cash donations to buy um, other food. Mm -hmm and distributing it. So we're currently supporting about 350 low-income people in the broader Ithaca area around us, um, both through the uh, mutual aid boxes. Yeah. Are, yeah. are those and those, then food pantries. I was going to say, they started to do like those, those blue cupboards. I don't know, have you seen those? Yes, yeah. yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, through those, and then also there's other pop-up food distribution hubs. Yeah. And last summer, I organized a, a food hub in which I just collected produce from people's gardens. You know, many of us are part of the CSA at West Haven, part of the Berry CSA. Yeah. Then we have our own community gardens. And then we are just like overflowing in this a bounty of amazing food and feeling guilty that we put the kohlrabi and the compost because we are not as familiar with it. <laughs> so um, so I revived something that had happened before, which was this EVI food hub. So mm -hmm. I ended up collecting about four coolers worth of food every week and then taking it to this pop-up food distribution. Mm. And we were some of the only fresh produce because, you know, mostly it was... Um, canned goods or yeah. snacks and things right, like that. Yeah. Right, very unhealthy stuff a yeah. lot, like white bread and yeah. donuts. And yeah. So this community looks different from the others, and this one's using, I would imagine, more state-of-the-art, but then is this also more affordable homes? So this is a combination. We, this is our third neighborhood, mm -hmm. nicknamed Tree, and we finished building this in 2015, so six years ago. And yes, it uses passive house uh, building technology, which is a German method of building. Um, it's not as aesthetic, I would say, mm -hmm. but it is incredibly energy efficient. Mm -hmm. So the houses um, and this common house, which also includes a number of apartments, 15 apartments, mm -hmm. was designed for sustainability and affordability and accessibility and aging in place, in other words, and, and also for people with disabilities. Right. And so because the, um, the houses are designed with these foot thick walls, you can't do a lot of angles and you know fun things but in many cases, the houses are operating at net zero energy, which is phenomenal. So we made a choice in organizing the tree neighborhood many years ago um, to have all electric homes. 
Mm. And at the time, that was considered totally radical. Yeah. And the reason that the group chose that was it was a political choice. We didn't support fracking. And even though we used natural gas in the first neighborhood, because at that time, that was considered, wow, that's a great transition fuel. Right. And, and now, with fracking, we were just so against um, using natural gas mm -hmm. that we decided to do everything all electric. Mm -hmm. And people had not really tried that much in this climate. Um, so by choosing to go all electric, it meant that we had to be incredibly energy efficient. Mm -hmm. We were already thinking about passive house. And by adding the solar panels, on the roofs, um, you can basically offset the heating, any cooling. Most of these houses are built without cooling, but now they're adding it with global warming. Yeah. Um, and all the appliances, all the plug load, they call it anything you plug into the mm -hmm. wall. So, so all of the energy needs are taken care of, even hot water through either solar electric or solar thermal, like on that porch roof, yeah. that's solar thermal. So Fascinating. Yeah. And then uh, how, this is, I guess, more of like, how do members interact within different neighborhoods? Like, do people have a tendency to just hang out in their neighborhood and call it a day? Or do you have ways for people? And I know you have like shared communal areas, but yeah. even when you're like, what I'm thinking, like when I was on campus at Cornell, you yeah. had West Campus and North Campus, and Neri did anybody from West Campus ever go up to North Campus and North Campus come to West Campus. So I'm just wondering here, you know, how is it? Is it kind of like an all-inclusive resort or all-inclusive neighborhood, and then they don't ever venture yeah. out to the other? <laughs> so I would say it really depends on people's personalities. Yeah. Some people are very much about their own neighborhood. Mm -hmm. I want to like get to know people around me. That's what's really important. Mm -hmm. And some people, like myself, consider every neighborhood fair game, you know, for <laughs> friendships, for doing fun things together. And so there's room for, for people at all of those levels. Yeah. And um, during COVID, we did more of the hunkering down. Mm -hmm. And now that COVID is over, I think most of us are really excited to <laughs> you know, spend time in other neighborhoods and um, see more of our friends, yeah. get a lot of hugs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. I, I wanted to point out the landscaping here. This is done, um, it was designed and implemented by a small team led by an artist hmm. who lives here. So I was going to ask if you had like a, a beautification committee yeah. who takes care of some of the more communal space gardens. Yes, yeah, we yeah. do. So um, it Jan looks a little steampunkish <laughs> in the back, and then <laughs> with the with the uh, sculpture. Yeah, yeah, I love it. Um, Janet is a sculptor, and she's in her 80s. She's one of our older residents, and. She just went to town here. She just, you know, she had a vision and she recruited other people and they put this together and every year it gets more beautiful. Yeah, more power to her, that's amazing. Yeah, and as you'll see, most of these are perennials. Yeah. So we're big on perennials because we don't like to too. do a lot I of watering. Too, yeah, <laughs> although probably some of the um, mm -hmm. annuals come in the little yeah, container yeah, plantings. Right, yeah, right. Yeah, but I'm a, I'm a perennial junkie too. <laughs> What's the point of this? I understand tender perennials, and we have to take them in. You know, <laughs> plant them out a little later. <laughs> oh, it, this is great, Liz. I mean, this is uh, quite marvelous just to see how everything shaped up because I got here, I think I visited Eco Village. I was considering of actually, you know, living here when I was in university because I think one of my friends yeah. had, had lived here or I like rented a room or something. Yeah. But that was back in like 2002, Two, Two, I think. So yeah. to see it expand yeah. and grow, I don't remember it like this. I was yeah. like, when, so when I got here, I 
wasn't quite knowing what I was going to expect, and it wasn't this, right. <laughs> so it wasn't right. this. But it's, yeah. uh, it's pretty miraculous. And to hear how you started yeah. with, as you said in your own words, being naive, mm -hmm. but having to learn along the way. And it just goes to show yeah. you that if you're organized and you're dedicated and you yeah. have a vision and uh, you are able to learn yeah. along the way, then you're able to actually get something like this together, which is like intensely sophisticated. Yeah. And yeah. I know you intimated to it as well, but it's not always a rose, uh, a walk through the roses. <laughs> <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> it's a lot sure. of hard work. A lot of yeah. hard work. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and a lot yeah. of personalities that you deal with. Even if yeah. you kind of have shared vision, you yeah. have all those personalities as well. So yeah, I can really imagine true. that there's some challenges along the way. Yeah, yeah. We actually, you had asked about conflict. So we mm -hmm. do have conflicts here. We're human. Yeah. And we strongly emphasize having people work out their conflicts. Mm -hmm. And so we, you know, if I, if we were talking and you lived here and you were complaining about an, another person, mm -hmm. I would say, oh, Summer, have you talked to that person mm -hmm. directly? Why don't you do that? Mm -hmm. And so it's just like those little interventions, like reminding each other, these are our values. This is how we do it around mm -hmm. here. And it's not that we're perfect. Oh my gosh, we're so imperfect. But we try over and over again. As I mentioned before, I just think it's so important in our world right now for people to learn these skills. Mm -hmm. You know, as much as we're doing environmental things that really make sense, mm -hmm. like Passive House and Net Zero Energy Homes, it's really a lot of the success of this place, I think, depends on the social skills and the communication and the visioning together. And actually, we have a group that I'm part of um, that is planning a 30-year uh, visioning uh, celebration and we're going to rent a big tent, put it over there, spend three days celebrating our 30 years together looking at, you know, how do we describe ourselves? How do we want to be? What do we want to be in the future? How do we want this community to interact with the larger world mm -hmm. at this particular moment in history? and what are our visions for this community going forward. So it'll be great. Well, one question to leave you with is, uh, yeah. is where did you and do you want to see Eco Village? Maybe mm -hmm. it started with one thing. Has mm -hmm. that changed over the years? And where would you like to actually see it in mm. 30, 60, 90 years <laughs> from now? <laughs> well, first of all, I hope it continues to grow and thrive and deepen. And I hope that the farms get more and more economically viable and that we further integrate with the larger community. Uh, for me, the educational programs are so important and we're kind of in flux right now. It's a little scary. You know, we've had all these years of fantastic educational programs with everybody from you know this age to adults but primarily university students and right now we don't have a director we have a, a really dedicated board for thrive which is our educational programs but it's been on hiatus with covid and it's really hard to now restart it without any staff. Mm. So I'm praying that that sort of gels and comes together and that we're able to pick up our educational programs and really get them moving again. Because we have such a message to share with the world and a lot of it is experiential. Yeah, I think that this is just such a, a wonderful template and it's inspiring mm. to us, you know, we're not, out there to start a, a large community ourselves, but mm -hmm. you can definitely learn from the lessons that you've shared and yeah. the structures that you've developed. So yeah, thank you so much for your time. Oh, you're very really welcome. Thanks yeah. for the opportunity. It's yeah. really nice to talk with you and, and to meet a friend of Dan's. I know. <laughs>